Hello and welcome to Views from the Top. My name's James Marley and I'm joined today by Casey McLean, who's the Portfolio Manager of the Fidelity Australian Opportunities Fund. Now we've just come off uh, the back of a busy reporting season. We've got a download from the CEOs on what's going on inside their companies. Casey's going to talk through some of the highlights, the lowlights and the opportunities that he's picked out of the companies he's following. Casey, good to see you. Thanks for coming in. You too, James. Thanks for having me. As I mentioned in the introduction, a big download from the leaders of Australia's uh, listed companies. What was the main message that you took away? Yeah, it was an incredibly interesting and volatile reporting season, really. And I think the big picture is that we're in the midst of a macro slowdown, but it's not a collapse. And if you look at the results, the FY23 numbers were pretty much in line with expectations. The real action was in the outlook statements and the guidance for FY24. And what we really saw was, was revenue was, was largely in line with, with what people were expecting, but it was at the cost line that we saw the real surprises. You know, wages, interest expenses, capex are going up, and that meant that earnings missed. For, and there was about four times the amount of uh, downgrades as there were upgrades for FY24. Uh, and we saw some pretty big dispersion between companies in the same sector around that cost outlook. If you think about you know, Westpac in, in the banks, their cost growth is running twice the pace of uh, CBA, uh, and that's off a lower, lower base as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Coles is similar. They're, they're running well ahead of Woolworths. You know, they're, they're, some of it is, is one-offs in their uh, supply chain uh, investments, uh, but a lot of it is, is permanent increases in, in wages and rents and salaries. And, and interestingly, they called out theft, you know, shrinkage in retail speak um, as, as a big driver, which, which is up... 20% um, over the year and part of that is that Woolies is, was invested in technology ahead of Coles and that's made Coles a bit of an easier target um, and that coupled with the, the cost of living pressure has meant that you've seen a lot of uh, pressure in, in increase in, in theft in their stores. Yep. So yeah, cost was the key, key driver um, and uh, yeah, that's where most of the discussions were focused over the reporting season. Markets, it's all about expectations. If markets are expecting a bad result and that's what comes out, there's not usually a huge reaction. From what you listened to and, and what you heard, how different was it from what you're expecting? And, yeah. and was, it, was it better than expected or worse than expected? On the whole, it was worse than expected in terms of outlook. Uh, but there was, it was a few surprises, I think. Firstly, if you think about stock reaction uh, and you classify the defensives versus the more cyclical companies, if a defensive company met expectations, it was sold off. Whereas if a cyclical company just met expectations, it did pretty well. And I think that really, the difference there is the expectations of the market coming into results, but also positioning. There has been a bit of a rotation out of those defensives. Uh, and I think the other thing that surprised a lot was, was dividends, you know, particularly in the commodities, in the mining space. I mean, even within lithium companies, you saw a big divergence with you know, Pilbara disappointing on their dis dividend. Whereas IGO, they increased their ordinary dividend, paid a special dividend you know, in total. It was, it was almost double what the market was expecting. Um, and that led to big divergence, even within a very narrow uh, group of companies like Lithium. Yeah, interesting. So what about your own portfolio? Um, anything that uh, proved a catalyst for you to make a change, uh, pick something up or dispose of something? Yeah, so a few changes been making over, over the reporting season, probably flowing through into, into the months ahead, is been trimming defensives, uh, especially the ones, the expensive defensives, which are proving less so now, and rotating some of that into, into cheaper defensives with arguably a better or more visible earnings outlook as well. So what's an example on that front? What's a, what's a, a less expensive defensive? Yeah, one, one we like is Ventia who's yep. in maintenance services. This is a company that has 95% of their contracts either cost plus or schedule of rates, meaning they can pass through any cost inflation. In fact, benefit from that, uh, especially as labor pressures are easing. Yep. Uh, and it trades on uh, you know, low double digit multiples, has a 7% yield and is growing sort of high single digits as well at the top end of their own guidance. Yep. Compare that to the likes of Telstra, which is double the multiple, uh, perhaps you know, their growth is starting to slow a bit as well. Yep. Um, I've watched a, a, a few of the, the, the videos, the interviews you've given, read some of your uh, articles, and you've, you've talked about this cautious view on the consumer. Mm -hmm. You outlined rising costs, rents, um, you know, things that can be putting um, you know, pressure on the consumer. Um, you know, could you maybe um, talk me through why you think consumer discretionary stocks were one of the few areas that bounced during August. Yeah, that's right. They, they were the, one of the better performing sectors. And I think that really 
again, reflects the expectations coming into the results. Yep. They were pretty low and expectations were met and there was a re relief rally. Yep. But I think if you, if you look longer term, it's pretty clear that there's a slowdown coming, growth is slowing, sales are coming down, um, and that reflects in earnings revisions for FY24. Macquarie, that they cover 24 consumer discretionary stocks that reported in August. They only upgraded one for FY24. Right. So more of a, not as bad, a little bit of relief rather than something more sustained? That's right. But I think the, the trend is, is maintaining. We're seeing a slowdown in consumer. It's just not the cliff that some people were expecting. Yep. And there is still big divergence within the consumer discretionary sector. So for instance, homewares, electronics, that was one that wore the slowdown first. Yep. And now things are starting to look a little bit better. But you know, something like apparel or fashion, they're, they're still to cycle some of their excess. Uh, and, and we're seeing clear changes in consumer behaviour. Like, uh, Coles talked about a survey of their own customers. And they said 90% plan to change their, their consumer behaviour in response to cost of living pressures. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they classify their products as, as good, better and best. And what they're seeing is there's a lot of trading down from the better category into the good. And at the same time, a lot of people are shifting from dining out in restaurants to dining in, and yeah. they're also shifting up from better to best. So th there's winners and losers out of this trading down environment, but what's pretty clear is that consumer behaviour is changing and, and that uh, still has some way to play out, I think. Yeah. I guess the other thing um, that you've talked about um, a, a bit as a beneficiary and a surprising beneficiary of inflation is um, the services sector. And these are um, non -disc less discretionary style spends versus eating out or, 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 or buying your food from Coles. Talk me through the thesis behind this beneficiary of sticky inflation. Yeah, well, I think the services are both a cause and a beneficiary of, of sticky inflation out inflationary outlook. Yep. So if you step back, I think there's two key trends that we can see in inflation. It's, it's firstly that the headline inflation has peaked and is moderating but core inflation is proving stickier than expected, you know, both in Australia and the US. Yeah. And when you break it down, headline inflation is mainly goods inflation, you know, the discretionary element, um, the nice to haves. Yeah. Once you've bought your, your TV in COVID, you don't need a second, you don't need a second coffee machine. Um, so that demand is normalising and they're also benefiting from supply chain normalisation. Whereas if you think about the core inflation element, a lot of it is, is the services. It's the non-discretionary items, the essentials. It's you know, your dentist, childcare, um, your hairdressers. And the primary cost input there is wages. Uh, wage growth is accelerating and that's pushing up prices in services. So there are the services companies that are able to pass through those cost pressures without seeing margin contraction are gonna benefit, mm -hmm. but you know, at the same time, if, if you have an inability to pass it on and the cost pressures are hitting uh, consumer spending in, in some categories, that's where you're going to see uh, companies uh, have a bad outlook based on that. Yep. And is this something that you're investing in? Yeah, it is. Like, like I mentioned, you know, Ventia is a really good example of yep. a company that's going to benefit from, from service inflation, especially given that um, the constraining factor for them has been labour. And at the margin, that's getting easier. They're seeing turnover levels reduce. The number of applicants for, uh, for job openings are increasing as well. Kelsey and the, the bus operator sort of echoes this as well. They're adding you know, 20 um, people per month now in, in, their, uh, in their bus operations and almost back to normal there as well. Yeah. Um, some of the others, I think, yeah, telcos are still a beneficiary now. They're trying to implement this new pricing regime around annual CPI increases, at least in mobile, which, yep. which seems to be sticking. Um, and some other areas are like are, um, in, uh, insurance, which is probably one of the biggest beneficiaries of sticky inflation, given you know, claims inflation, reinsurance costs have gone up yep. quite a lot from natural disasters, and that's leading to rising premiums. And, and at the same time, inflation leads to higher interest rates, which is improving their investment returns. So yep. the earnings outlook for insurance companies looks quite attractive. And is that an area that you're, you've got the fund heavily exposed to? It is, particularly within the financials. I think insurance is the key beneficiaries of higher interest rates rather than banks, where we're seeing a lot of competition um, on the mortgage side, partly, but, but more importantly, I think on the deposit side, yep. where term deposit uh, rates are going up quite sharply and bonus savings are going up outside of interest rate increases. And we're going to see continued, even if interest rates peak, we're going to see continued mix shift 
within their funding arrangements as they, the banks need to refinance the, the term funding facility, which is a, the almost free money the government gave out during COVID. Yeah. And do you have a preferred play in the insurance space? Well, I think uh, probably the safest and most visible sort of growth is in the brokers. Uh, okay where you don't suffer the underwriting risk that the general insurers do as well. Yep. Uh, that's an attractive sector. They're just benefiting from the premium yep. rate cycle. But I think within the general insurers, um, QBE looks attractive to me. It's, it's the cheapest of the major insurers. They also have a self-help story where they're uh, uh, just improving their business quality, rationalising some lines in the US to improve profitability. And I can see a sustained ra re rating in that stock as their, their return on equity rises. Yep. Now, you're not alone in making this call, but I've heard you describe the small cap sector as being quite cheap. Yep. Um, it's underperformed relative to large caps for a sustained period of time. And uh, it's like the patient on the table waiting for, for some life to get breathed back into it. Um, is there anything you saw during August to suggest that the outlook's improving? Well, yeah, like, like you say, the, the small cap sector's underperformed the large cap brethren by about 20% over the last two years, which is, is the largest on record. Mm. And from a share price point of view, we're seeing that underperformance come to an end, but hasn't yet started to outperform. But if you think about the commentary and economic indicators, there does look like there's a bit of life coming back into the sector. Uh, it, it's small caps by nature, they're, they're heavily leveraged to the macro environment and the economic cycle. And uh, there is some, some signs of positivity there. If you think about you know, housing, approvals might be still very weak, but housing prices have turned positive yeah. and listing volumes are, are rising now, at least in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, in mining, you know, exploration activity has been very weak, yep. but you've seen a, rain, a round of um, equity raisings by the junior miners, which can lead to more activity down the track. And then even within the financials, the, the fund managers and platforms, the flows are getting less bad and in some cases improving there as well. So yep. there's signs of life there and I think it's definitely an area of, that uh, we're focused on in the, in the upcoming cycle. What about corporate activity? Has the phone been ringing for sounding you out for IPOs and appetite for that sort of stuff? Not a great deal. Um, there's been a few uh, raisings and a bit, of, uh, a bit of a pipeline starting to build, but it's relatively thin at the moment. Um, there's only been one major IPO redox recently, which was a moderate success. Uh, but I think that window for fresh equity is, is opening now and, and probably 2024 will be a much better year. Yeah, interesting. A couple of questions to finish off. Um, off the back of reporting season, what was a, a result that impressed you that you maybe thought the market missed or flew under the radar? Yeah, I think one that uh, I was focused on was Babcor, who are an auto aftermarkets uh, a, a retailer and, and wholesaler. In fact, 80% of their business is in trade or wholesale, only 20% in retail. Yeah. And, and their results were, were largely unexciting. They, they met their guidance, revenue grew by 10%, margins improved in that core trade and wholesale bit. Um, and, that's, and that's what you'd expect, right? because uh, their, their earnings are perhaps even counter cyclical in that when times get tough, you hang on to your, your car for longer. If it breaks, you have to fix it. Yeah. But what I think really flew under the radar for them is their cost out program, which they call better than before. Yeah. And they're targeting $100 million in, in net EBIT benefits by FY25. You compare that to their peak uh, EBIT, 200 million, so 50% upside. Mm. And prior to the results, the market was giving them virtually no credit for that cost program. Many um, sell-side estimates had, had zero benefit. But what's becoming clear is there's some real low-hanging fruit that they can, they can pluck to make these cost improvements. So they've, they've historically grown through M&A and bolting on um, new trade um, companies, new wholesalers as well. And they haven't really talk to each other in terms of procurement. And now they're centralising procurement, they're rationalising their suppliers. And instead of you know, one supplier of oil filters just supplying the trade business or just supplying the wholesale, they're negotiating it company-wide, then getting pricing discounts. Yep. The other is that they're now implementing a hub and spoke supply chain model where the larger stores maintain a bigger inventory of the, the slow moving parts, whereas the smaller uh, stores, they just maintain fast moving parts and they they share inventory amongst them as well. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the, it's now getting much more visible that some of these benefits are really tangible. And the stock trades on just mid-teens, PE, 
Um, and I think it looks pretty attractive if they, div they deliver even a portion of their cost out. If reporting season was a, a health check on the Australian economy, what's the, the diagnosis or the report that you would give as we head into 2024? Well, I think the Australian economy, Australian market, it, it's got a bit of a sniffle, but they've popped a, a couple of codrill and they're soldiering on at the moment. And the question is whether you know, that sniffle turns into something more virulent. And I think the key to that really is unemployment. Uh, if unemployment rises much above 4.5%, uh, I think that's when it could turn into a flu. Yeah. But the good point is that Australia has, you know, the medicine to, to cure anything. I think we've got now room to cut rates. You know, the population is growing. So even if the, you know, the market does catch a flu, I think it will be relatively short-lived. And, you know, our sort of base case is that Australia still avoids an, a recession, at least at the aggregate level. Yep. But I think within that, within the, the market and the economy, there's still going to be pockets of stress and, and opportunity that come out of that. Yeah, great. Well, thanks very much for coming in today and thanks for sharing your insights from what was no doubt a really busy but interesting reporting season. Great. Thanks very much, James. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Casey. Remember to check in on our YouTube channel on a regular basis. We're adding fresh content every week.